Hello, I'm Eric Topol, Editor-in-Chief of Medscape, and I'm thrilled actually to have with me Eric Schatt for a one-on-one -on -one Medscape interview today. And Eric is the director of the ICON Institute here at Mount Sinai, uh, the ICON School of Medicine. So welcome. It's great to have you. Thank you. So I know you have a remarkable background in mathematics. And how do you go from mathematics to what you're doing now? Yeah, that's a great question. So I was uh, you know, actually in pure mathematics, which is uh, sort of the drilling deep in math for the sake of math. So it's about as detached as you can imagine uh, from applied math. Uh, but once I achieved PhD candidacy in pure math, started, uh, you know, I had a computer science uh, applied math undergrad, started thinking more about uh, how math could be applied, started hearing a lot about the sequencing of the human, human genome and hearing about technologies that were coming in biology uh, that may demand uh, sort of a more quantitative mathematical approach. So started going to uh, some seminars on uh, where biology was headed and uh, sort of got bitten by the bug of, uh, you know, let's understand living systems to a, a deeper level and uh, then made the jump from uh, pure math into an applied math uh, biology program. What's impure math? Impure math. Well, you know, so the mathematicians want to, you know, how do you, mathematics on its own is a quite a beautiful uh, discipline and the kinds of relationships you can explore in that sort of logic driven way don't necessarily have a easy tie into the physical space. So the, the impure math would be more the applied, like how do we take what we know about mathematics and apply it to real mm -hmm. physical problems. Uh, and, and now I'm sort of uh, turned that corner that I think, uh, you know, maybe I wouldn't have ever been one of the greatest pure mathematicians, but I can be a greater applied mathematician to take that mind share and help apply it to the real world. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. Now I know Eric Lander also has a background in math, so there's a couple of noted people in genomics that have come through that. Path. Indeed. In fact, my advisor Ken Lang, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. was a pure math sure. uh, guy and was sort of in that wave of you know Eric Lander and Elston and, yeah, and that group. Else. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, a really interesting connection there. Yeah. So, um, speaking of connections, you've had a really interesting background where you did some time in uh, a startup Rosetta and Merck and right. Pacific Bio. So you've been on this unusual path of having gone into life science industry, startups, right. and then back into academics. So what, how's it like to live on both sides of this experience? Yeah, I think the, you know, out of my PhD, the attraction to a company like Roche and then ultimately the startup company Rosetta was, uh, you know, the focus in scale of resources to tackle a new area of biology, which was this high dimensional, multi-scale view, technologies that could look at the entire system, all genes at once, uh, and the kind of money that required the focus. You know, the biology community back then wasn't necessarily sold on where that technology was going to go. The NIH wasn't funding things at a large scale at that point because it, it was unproven. Um, so the company was really an avenue uh, where they bet, Roche bet heavily on this technology and they were dumping serious amounts of money. So went into it just wanting access to the technology and to apply it to real biology. and. Um, you know, and, and that was successful, right? So we achieved pretty good success in showing how we can use gene chip, Appymetrics, gene chip technology to better understand diseases like, like asthma and cardiovascular disease. Um, but then what I learned at Roche was, you know, there's a line here of, you know, the academic uh, industry divide. Uh, that's not many people that want to ride that line, but if you can master riding that line, I think it's a, a good existence, a good way to kind of benefit from what a company has to offer, benefit from what an academic uh, institution has to offer, where you can sort of minimize the, the weaknesses of both by maximizing the strengths of both. So yeah. I, I think learned through my career how to, how to kind of play that game and became comfortable uh, living in that Yeah, uh, and it's not very gray common. Zone. And not very looks common. looks like you've done it really well. Yeah, I don't know that I have any special <laughs> skills. I think it was more like it's harder. Like, you know, when I was at Roche and Rosetta, it wasn't just needing to meet the demands of a company, especially a startup, as you know, you know, those are intense uh, efforts. Uh, but I had to maintain my academic identity by publishing papers and, you know, being involved in that kind of academic research that would lead to publications on a scale that would be respected by the academic community. So it was a harder, a little harder of a push than, you know, you would if you lived in any world uh, uh, independently. But in my, in my uh, experience, it was well worth uh, the effort because, again, you you know, there's an opportunity to gain uh, the advantages of each 
minimize the weaknesses of each, and I think an appetite on both sides to see that happen, to yeah. blur that line. Well, that's only one aspect of you of an unusual pass you've taken. I guess one of the other ones that was interesting to me uh, is that you went, you, you, before you even finished high school, you went into the Air Force? Yeah, so I, uh, <laughs> sort of my great escape from rural uh, Michigan was, uh, you know, going into the military. Uh, again, was sort of, uh, had lots of energy and wanted to explore the world, and so that uh, was one of the ways, uh, you know, like didn't come from a wealthy background, was pretty impoverished, and so that was, uh, again, an avenue that I saw to get out into the real world and start exploring what it could be. It was very physical at the time, uh, so was, uh, you know, went into the Air Force's pararescue program, which is a very elite physical program and got injured uh, during the training in that and washed out, and mm. that began my uh, exposure to the academic side. <laughs> Now, you've had a few accidents along the way. More recently, I know, earlier this year. Yeah, the it? snowboarding. So, yeah. Uh, so I try to maintain some physical activity uh, beyond my younger days. And yeah, so it was, we're out with my uh, sons uh, on the big hills uh, going extremely fast on a day where the conditions weren't uh, ideal. Caught, you know, good enough air, bad landing, and uh, hit really hard and broke my clavicle in five places and broke four ribs and mm. collapsed a lung and a little concussion. So now I can think about traumatic brain injury Oof. <laughs> and the Oof. results that hopefully I don't succumb to uh, 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 that kind of damage. But, but knowing you, that won't hold you back from speed, I guess. No, in fact, we'll be <laughs> up uh, this uh, weekend at the New York Safety Track in upstate New York on my uh, BMW S1000RR trying to... <laughs> Go 200 plus miles an hour on the really? track with uh, so you really with the bike. You, you have a real need for this. The right? speed is yeah addicting. I think what it offers is uh, you know in the snowboarding and on a super bike is uh, as you know like when you're thinking about science problems and solving these hard problems they consume you. And the snowboarding and riding super bikes is one of the few ways uh, I have to completely detach. Like your survival depends on you focusing. So it's one of the few things I can do that causes me to tune everything what, else out. So. Even with these accidents, it doesn't hold you back? Yeah, it doesn't hold me back, but as I get older, like it definitely, uh, you know, like I don't want to have a catastrophic uh, injury where I'm, I'm debilitated are, for the Are rest there of other my ways life, to get so. an adrenaline rush besides yeah. going at 200 yeah. plus? Or? Well, I think, the tra and that's why you do it on the New York safety track. Oh, like, okay. Yeah, I'm not okay. on, on the open road. You, you wouldn't do that so. on the open road, I guess. No, not me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, uh, you have a distinct uh, kind of iconic look. I, 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 mean, I know I'm overdressed today. I should have worn my <laughs> cargo shorts, but what did that, how did that come about that you, you know, even in the middle of winter, you be, might be seen with, your, you know, cargo shorts? What, what's yeah, going I think on it, uh, you know, maybe a carryover from the military, mm -hmm. the one thing. Uh, I didn't enjoy much about the military, but the one thing that uh, was easy was the dress because you, it was a, sort of this uniform. You didn't have to think about what you were wearing every day and as I uh, got out of the military and into pure math like it drove me so deep on how like how smart was I and you know could I solve these really really hard problems and it just caused a, like a transformation in my mind about how deeply I could think and how hard I could think and I wanted to tune out all other like I didn't want to have to think about like looking in the closet and what am I going to wear today and what color do I want the shirt to be and so it just sort of slowly morphed towards it was very easy. Like uh, back when I was in graduate school, it was just t-shirts and shorts. And, uh, so you and up then I just, upgraded. I upgraded uh, <laughs> once I got into the commercial world because they didn't like the t-shirts. Uh, but it kind of stuck that it uh, was an easy thing. Like it's low energy. I don't have to think about it. And as I sort of uh, went through time, people thought it was kind of cool that, you know. Yeah. And it's not unlike, and not that I equate myself with Steve Jobs or, or uh, Zuckerberg, but there seems to be that theme in yeah, sure. some people where they enjoy not having to think about what they wear. And, yeah. you got other things to keep got other busy. things to think about. And. So when you were recruited here to the Icon Institute, um, did you ever meet up with Carl Icon, or how did that work out that you were allured here? Yeah, so great question, because it was uh, the East Coast, I'll say straight off, was not my top place <laughs> to live, and I was sitting in sunny Palo Alto, California, yeah, and uh, yeah. I was with Pacific Biosciences and really enjoying uh, what I was doing there, really transformational technology. They were being very supportive and allowing me to build a research program outside of PacBio um, to really exploit the technology and solve big problems of disease. 
Uh, so in effect was trying to do in Palo Alto what I'm doing here and that was form an institute um, in collaboration with PacBio and build out this big data analytics center and have it hooked up to like a Stanford or UCSF. And as we you know, tried to raise the scale of money, felt like we needed you know, on the order of $100 million to build out that kind of thing, to hire the right kind of people in and get a scale. Uh, but it was during the, the Great uh, Recession. Uh, yeah, so it was kind, a, of kind of a tough time, time to do tough that. Time yeah. to do it. Uh, so as I spread my uh, net to look further as we were having trouble you know, in the Bay Area raising that kind of money, uh, basically ran into uh, Carl Icahn and Mount Sinai and they were looking to make this kind of investment mm, and mm. initially tried to convince them that wouldn't it be cool to have a Mount Sinai Institute in Palo Alto <laughs> and benefiting from, uh, uh, so tried to convince them that that would be a good thing. You, you but, couldn't uh, make the sale on that Couldn't one. make the sale. <laughs> uh, and then when I, uh, so still didn't want to you know, move to the East Coast, but I uh, finally made a visit out to Mount Sinai and was just amazingly impressed. Uh, not just with a Carl Icahn willing to contribute a pretty big investment, but with the leadership of Mount Sinai taking this very long uh, range view of where mm -hmm. medicine was going to go and that information was going to be king and you know how could what what would we have to do to become competitive to survive you know in five to ten years time so they were really thinking uh, progressively that way and it sort of convinced me that this was a place. Uh, where the kind of vision I had could happen. Yeah, that's terrific. I know you've hired a lot of interesting people outside of the specter of medicine, like Jeff Hammerbacker yeah. from Facebook. and right. So you really have a, a different uh, idea of how to build something like this out, right? Yeah, it's exactly. Not, not the traditional it's, way at all. Right, not the traditional <laughs> way. And in fact, uh, you know, so going after, you know, so the problem is one of how do we, you know, how do we really leverage the digital universe of information to build more predictive models, to point at a patient at Mount Sinai as they walk through the doors of the medical center to better diagnose and, and treat or even prevent disease in those individuals. And that, you know, sort of demands a different type of, that's not the maybe classical medical doctor and classical biology uh, researcher. That's somebody who thinks a lot about big scale data, about information, about, you know, machine learning and deep learning. Uh, so the types of guys, uh, you know, I brought in were guys like Jeff Hammerbacher, who, you know, a pretty amazing guy who was the founding chief data scientist of Facebook and then formed Cloudera, which has been this amazing success on how do we bring Hadoop-style computing to the masses. Like, we need to be able to build out web-scale architectures in these types of settings as the scales of data grow and then have all the right analytical minds on those data to, uh, you know, build the models that then can be translated more clinically. But as you know, and I've admired uh, your uh, career and the impacts you're having on digital health, there's that, uh, you know, it's not enough to have the smart modelers uh, building the sophisticated model. You need a way to translate that, get that in the hands of physicians, get that into the hands of the consumer, the patient, uh, to sort of enable them to better understand what, uh, what might be going on in the system. And so we've very much built out a you know, hired probably 250 people in the last three years, so it's been pretty crazy uh, to move at that scale. That's, uh, we're a big that's percentage good for of employment here in New York City. Yeah, so we've done good for uh, the, the, the economy <laughs> yeah. uh, and job creation, but it's, uh, you know, really all, you know, probably half of that aimed towards big data analytics and predictive modeling. And you've taken the big data, obviously, beyond omics to mobile medicine and your recent uh, creation of the asthma app with Apple and I know you're on the uh, worldwide developers conference so right. did you have that initially idea that you were going to get to the whole mobile device uh, world as well yeah so I don't know that initially um, I was as oriented in that direction I think what we knew was we wanted to collect as much information as we could around individuals who have never been constrained by like DNA you know that it's all in the DNA or the RNA or metabolites, we've always looked at it as a more holistic right. problem where we need to pull in as many dimensions as we can, uh, integrate them to build these models. Uh, but seeing the kind of work you uh, were driving with the wireless uh, devices, like seeing that whole revolution coming where it was going to enable a whole new scale of phenotyping on individuals uh, and not just in snapshots that uh, when you go to the doctor's office, but longitudinally over time. Uh, was just a very natural thing for us to want to uh, sort of jump on that bandwagon and, and use it as, an, as another avenue to create 
larger and larger scale phenotypic data collected longitudinally that we could integrate with the molecular you data. Yeah, it's fantastic. You're really revolutionizing so. medical research. I mean, it's a whole other uh, way to, as you say, collect data. Could you ever ingest enough data? Is your appetite for data as, as, as big as it gets? I think uh, it's among the as big as it gets, and uh, it's a frustration to many because we always we never want to accept the boiled down. You know, even with the imaging folks, uh, where we wanted to start to integrate the imaging data with the molecular, we didn't want to accept the principal component reductions that they would do to come up with the main basis vectors for interpreting you know structural feature information in the brain. We wanted the voxel level, uh, you know, pixel level information, and start uh, from scratch. So it's sort of a uh, somewhat of a natural bent to want to work at the lowest level and, and then work your way up to, to the highest level. Although I'll say that I think you know we'll run into technology limits uh, oh. eventually with the kind of uh, you know as uh, single cell sequencing uh, comes into play as we start sequencing more routinely whole genomes like your genome won't be sequenced once it'll maybe be, be sequenced several times a week even if you know to monitor what's going on and uh, your system, and at that level, I think the data will be uh, too vast and to cost too much money to store, and so we'll have to think about how we get smarter with reducing mm -hmm. that dimensionality. Yeah. So I'm starting to see the limits, at least. That uh, Well, that's good, because yeah, uh, we, so. <laughs> we certainly have been big on hoarding data and kind of short on processing and make, making what counts out of it. So one of the other things that you've been big on, I know you've worked a lot with Stephen Friend, is on the whole open data, open yeah. science, and that's, I, I think, part and parcel of this theme, but can you tell us a little about your philosophy on that? Yeah, so that was really born out of the pharmaceutical experience we had, so we were part of the startup that Stephen founded, I was chief scientist, and we uh, were acquired by Merck, and uh, which was kind of fun in the beginning, because we had sort of this five-year run where they invested very heavily in us running technologies and big disease groups and really trying to figure out the biology of disease. But the problem was they wanted to hoard that information. They didn't want to see it uh, shared broadly. They didn't want to see the models we were building used broadly. They wanted to maintain a competitive advantage with that uh, data. And what Stephen and I were thinking the whole time was, you know, we really need to push to make biology pre-competitive in the pharmaceutical space. And that's going to help uh, everybody, right? It's going to benefit the pharma because they're going to make better bets uh, because they're going to have better models uh, that get refined by the communities. Uh, it's going to obviously benefit the communities to have access to more information to build better models. So Sage Bio Networks was really born out of this want to mm -hmm. make biology pre-competitive, offer platforms that would enable broad sharing of data, have the appropriate governance rules and incentives to, you know, to make people want to be able to uh, participate in that and I think just in biology and medicine if we want to take things to the next level if we want to get to where where they're at in physics or climatology or quantitative finance where mo models rule the day where knowledge and understanding is organized in these models you know we as biologists and medical researchers have to be hosting these models in an open way that enables everybody to pound on them to evaluate the the efficacy to compete them against one another to refine them and evolve them in a dynamic adaptive way like that has to happen or we won't achieve all the you know the vision of precision medicine and and the impact those data can have on real lives yeah no that's so darn important it's fantastic what you've been doing uh, with others to lead that whole movement <laughs> now the last year i wanted to get in with you is about it's unusual for a, a data geek uh, in the most uh, affectionate way to, right? uh, to really be able to connect with the media, with being able to tell your story into the, uh, to, to the lay public. And you've been doing that for a while. You're really good at it. Now, the first time I remember seeing a really great story was with Esquire. You did, yeah. a, a, it was a profile, and it was. it was about how you would get on planes and get linked to a supercomputer and do right. all kinds of analysis. Are you still doing that? And, and where, do, where, and patient zero t and other things more recently. Tell us about how, what that experience is like and uh, whether you think that also is important uh, to try to advance the field. So the uh, sort of the media exposure side, yeah, yeah. or the doing supercomputing Both. on the airplane. <laughs> yeah, all that stuff. So yeah, so I think, you know, what I've learned through the company path is that selling your ideas, selling where you want to go to those individuals who control the purse, purse strings is really critical. And a company like Merck, for example, wasn't really designed to think about systems biology and mathematical modeling and all of that. And what we had to be able to do to sell them on the idea was kind of try to boil it down and 
you know, simplify it, come up with uh, certain, you know, visualizations, animations, and so on to help convey very complicated uh, material to people who didn't quite get it, but if they did get it, could really enable you. So there was a lot of, uh, you know, sort of uh, almost environmental context mm -hmm. that drove that mm -hmm. want to do that. You know, uh, Pacific Biosciences really uh, solidified that. A guy there, Stephen uh, Turner, oh, who yeah. maybe you profile Sunday, he uh, founded this company, one of the most brilliant guys I've ever met in my life. And he thinks... Uh, in, it's saying uh, a lot, by the way. Yeah, it's saying <laughs> a lot. And, but he taught me a lot just in the importance of uh, people who think more visually and communicating complex uh, material through, uh, through visualizations and sophisticated animation. So I've always viewed that as important. I think going to the media, like again, it's uh, selling what you're doing more broadly. You know, we're all funded by, uh, or a lot of us, through government research and uh, we depend on people trusting in the kind of research studies we run and participating in those. Uh, they're ultimately the ones we serve in the medical centers. And so we have to, I think, take uh, the role seriously of how do we educate, how do we expose what's happening because it is amazing. And I think if we can help people understand where everything's going, you know, what are the technologies, what's the potential of those technologies if applied appropriately, and what's needed to get to that point where they can be applied appropriately, my thought has always been that if we can sell that more generally, that we're going to have yeah, and better I, success. I think that's really important. I think, uh, by and large, a lot of researchers, scientists, shy away from it, right. but I think you are a really good model for how important uh, impact that can have. Now, in just in closing, there's a lot of young people out there uh, in biomedicine, and yeah. they're trying to figure out what they're going to do in their career. What, what advice do you have for them? Yeah, I think the advice, uh, I guess several lines. If you're still in uh, school, you know, still going through your program, I think take as much quantitative uh, reasoning, computing as you can. I think we're seeing all of biology and medicine you know, going more purely to an information-driven science. And if you want to be a master in that universe, uh, knowing how to think statistically, knowing how to approach problems computationally, understanding you know, how big data is stored and, and uh, accessed. Like you don't need to be a deep exer expert, but having an awareness mm -hmm. of the different groups that what roles they play like enables you to better manage and form the right teams. So I think super uh, critical. The other is maybe getting to some of your earlier questions on the business, uh, you know, academic divide. I think, you know, go into it, um, you know, wanting to solve, you know, the biggest, hardest problems in sort of getting resources. Don't be constrained by where you think resources need to come from. Like, don't think they, you need to maintain this pure idealistic needs to be in the academic arena funded by the NIH. You know, there's a really big appetite now, especially as NIH funding is held at a, at a more steady level to you know partner with companies who can provide lots and lots of resources and you have to work out you know the terms and you know how IP is going to work out like all of that mm. uh, is important and, and but don't shy away from it like embrace it uh, get on the mission to solve uh, yeah. the problems that matter have that kind of impact and if you want to have the higher impact it's going to be all about how you can connect the dots not just within your academic center but with different companies technology centers I mean, as you know, you know, forming all the uh, collaborations with different device makers, uh, you know, Apple, Google, you know, these guys are going to be powerhouses and play really influential roles in the future of medicine. Yeah. And how we can tie that all together, I think, uh, demands a new uh, way of thinking about uh, about an academic uh, existence being more uh, interconnected. No, I think you're right on about medicine getting datafied, and how some of the big tech titans are now really into medicine really than they into, ever were yeah, before. Right. And uh, interacting and being having that plasticity, all these are really great points. Yeah. So, Eric, thanks so much. Um, you're uh, certainly one of a kind, uh, mo one of the most interesting people in, in medicine today. So thanks, and uh, we want to thank all of you for your attention uh, to our interview, and look forward to bringing some of the other most interesting people in the world of medicine uh, to Medscape. Thank you.